Is Washington's group of pass catchers the best in the country? Let's talk about it. You are Locked On Huskies, your daily podcast on the Washington Huskies. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Every day is welcome to Lockdown Huskies. Thank you for making this your first watch or first listen of the day. I'm Roman Tomashoff. That's Lars Hansen. We cover the Huskies with Sports Illustrated Fan Nation for Inside the Huskies. You can read all our work at si.com slash college slash Washington. Today, we are talking about the wide receivers and the tight ends. We're just, we're calling them the pass catchers. We're grouping them all. I, I wanted to just say this is the takers episode, but you know, that's strictly a wide receivers thing and a Jamarcus Shepard thing. And you know, we'll, we'll definitely get into a little bit of that. But first, I want to remind everybody that this episode is brought to you by FanDuel. FanDuel, make every moment more. Right now, when you bet on a Super Bowl winner, you can get bonus bets every time they win the regular season. Go to FanDuel.com slash LockedOn to learn more. Now, Lars, uh, there's some news we're going to get to. We're going to talk a little bit more about Giles Jackson's injury, which, you know, I just published that story on Inside the Huskies. People should go read a little bit more about it there. But we need to just talk about it. Is this the best group of wide receivers? And we've talked solely about the wide receiver position because we'll get into tight ends in a little bit. Wide receivers alone, is this the best group in the country? It's up there. I mean, it's certainly the, 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 only, the only debate really is who's better, Washington or Ohio State. I think Ohio State arguably has the two better top end receivers, but top to bottom of the room, I think it goes to Washington. I, I think that's a pretty kind of fair way to split that up because – Oh, Absolutely. Marvin Harrison and Emeka Buka, who Washington fans know the latter especially We're sorry. well. We're sorry. But, but right, it's like we didn't do that. That wasn't our fault. <laughs> but uh, those two are kind of – they're in their own right. Rome is kind of right on the cusp of where they're at. I think he's the closest of the receivers in the room to, to that level. But three – or really two through seven in that room can all play. Whereas Ohio State, I don't – nobody really knows who were the kind of four or five and six guys. And that really makes an offense because it's it's not again it's not easy to take away Marvin Harrison or Mecca, but you can kind of lock lock down one of them and then force the one to get the bulk of the targets. When you have Washington's room of five and six guys deep or even seven deep, it's there's just a mismatch all over the field. No, absolutely. And then I mean, because the conversation for the Huskies starts with Roma Dunze. And I think he's going to have a very strong case to win the Blitnikoff Award this year. He was just excellent last year. I talked to him today, uh, record, obviously we're recording this on Wednesday after practice, and he talked about how he needed to get stronger, needed to get more physical, and then he feels he's done a really good job of adding that to his game. And this is somebody who uh, the Athletic put out a couple months ago that he can run a 4-3-4 40-yard dash at six foot three and 215 pounds, which is just wild enough as it is. And the fact that he's added that to his game and – Chris Brout runner went for close to 1100 yards last year. He's already a phenomenal player. And I think that another year in this offense uh, that Kalen DeBoer and Ryan Grove have drawn up with Michael Penix, who's going to be a Heisman candidate at quarterback. I think that he's going to have a really strong case by the end of the year. I don't know if his numbers might necessarily match up with what Marvin Harrison's are because he's just a target hog in that offense. But I think that even on fewer targets, Rome can produce at the same level that Mar- Marvin Harrison can. And, it, and we touched on that a bit last in the last couple of days about how the Washington's offense is structured differently than Ohio State's, for example, to where they might not have the number of catches, but they actually might have more yards because yes. they can do more with less. You're, you're willing to have – I mean, let's go back to the Oregon game where Jalen Polk has the 70-plus yard touchdown on one play. It's like, okay, he only had three catches, but he has 120 yards. That's just kind of how Washington offense goes, whereas Marvin Harrison might have, you know, 12 for 210. Right. Okay. That, 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 but they're two different style of offenses. And I think, honestly, if you're a receiver, you kind of want to play in the latter because you're going to get so many more chances. And also you get the benefit of work playing with great receivers and just learning from each other. So I think that's kind of a perk of the room of Washington. But getting back to the point at hand, I just think when you look at Washington's top to bottom room, it Rome obviously is the bell cow of the room. But what's interesting when I asked him today, because Jamarcus Shepard said a couple of days ago that Rome ran the fastest 40 of the entire room during the offseason. But Rome acknowledged too that Jalen was kind of right on his heels there, which is a little surprising, I think, to, you know, at least to some people, but also kind of as a testament to just how much better this room has gotten in the offseason to where they were one of the best in the Pac 12 and if not the country last year. 
I do want to ask, are you talking about Jalen McMillan or Jalen Polk? Because we do have to make that. Jalen McMillan. Jalen McMillan. Yeah, Yeah, Jalen. And that's what was interesting was the fact that Jalen is fast, but he just doesn't have that kind of that gear. But it also gear, yeah. It almost seems like they both have found it this year with Rome again as just kind of the head above Jalen McMillan. But the fact that they're right there, I mean, Rome said it, I think you were there when he said it, that they're right. That he was kind of on his heels when they were running those forties. And it's like, that, that just is indicative of how good this room can be and will be this fall. Right. And it's something where I, cause you want, you talk about the depth. I really want to talk about Denzel Boston, and Jeremy Bernard, who Rome, as we spoke to him today, had really, really high praise for both of those guys. And, uh, I know I've, I've talked about it a little bit on previous episodes, but Denzel Boston has really been just the person that stuck out to me the most throughout fall camp. He's just been such a fantastic player where he's that big physical mold and uh, he's been in the weight room, as, as Rome said, and has really uh, also added that, that extra level of physicality to his game. But he can also really run for somebody who's six foot three and he's really improved in, in his route running ability and can high point the football really well. And it's just somebody who I think is really going to make an impact this year. And then we can talk about Jordan Bernard transfer from Michigan state who didn't necessarily have the impact there that he wanted to in his first year after originally signing with the Huskies out of high school. And now that he's back, he's somebody who you watch him after the catch and it's just like, wow, because he's already really physical. He's a super strong dude. You just look at the size of his legs and yeah, that that guy's going to run through some people this year. And he's somebody who's super reliable with the ball in his hands. And I think he's going to break a couple of big plays. We saw it the first play he made at the college level was a 40 yard touchdown. Yeah. Well, and I think what's interesting when you, when we watch him in camp, it's like the, the, the defensive backs would be right on him. And then he has, I don't, I don't want to call breakaway speed, but it's again, kind of just grabs fifth gear and breaks away from the defensive backs. That's and especially when we go back to having a quarterback like Michael Penix, where he can put the ball at any hash on the field having those receivers, I mean, you need to have all five of those guys be able to do that. And it's really kind of crazy how this room came together because a couple this time last year, we all knew about uh, Jalen McMillan and Roma Dunze. But as your point, Denzel has come so much, so much further along. There's so many other guys in the room. Jalen Polk is, it seems like he's bigger. He's I think he's going to do numbers this year. Just everybody's gotten bigger. And I think it's almost crazy to think, we had a, we had trouble wondering how they would replicate their success. We're wondering how they're not going to now at this point. Right. No, that's 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 a really great point. And I think that this room, just with the way these guys have evolved and progressed in their game, it's going to be way deeper than it was last year when we saw them have two thousand yard receivers. Jalen Polk had nearly seven hundred yards. But just with the way that the ball can be spread out, especially on the second team now as well, we can talk about. Tayshawn Lyons, who's gotten some reps with the second team with uh, due to Giles Jackson's injury, which again, we'll get to a little bit later on. But that's something where there's there's just so much to be desired here. I wouldn't be surprised if Michael Panix tops his, his numbers from last year because they're just they're just that good. Yes, yeah, that's the thing. Is like, it, it's, it is crazy to think that Michael can do better than he did last year, but it's it's when you look at it, obje- honestly, and we're looking at it objectively because – we do play devil's advocate. Like, okay, well, what if they take away Rome? What if they take away Jan? What if so-and-so sure. gets hurt? It's like, yeah, even if you have injuries, you still have the bodies there. They may not have as much of experience as Rome and Jalen do with their 1,000-yard receiver years last year, but they're all capable of doing it. And if you put them into the position, I think they're going to execute it just as well. No, that's that's a really great point. And it's just, just kind of as we wrap up here, I think that putting some money on Roma Dunze is going to be a great – Great, great. If you want to just do that for the Bolitnikov, that would just kind of, kind of be a great idea, you know. And you know where else is also a great place to put your money? FanDuel. Football season is about to kick off, and FanDuel is giving you the chance to win all season long. Because right now, when you bet on a Super Bowl winner, you can get bonus bets every time they win in the regular season. Just pick any team to win the Super Bowl, and you'll get bonus bets for every victory. You can use those bonus bets on spreads, player props, over unders, and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn and start earning bonus bets with America's number one sportsbook. That's FanDuel.com slash LockedOn. Now, real quick, I know I've, I've thrown out some bets in the past where, you know, just guarantees. Three here. Jalen Hurts, plus 1,200 for MVP. I think that's a great bet. Mac Jones, Offensive Player of the Year on FanDuel right now, plus 20,000. And the Bengals, to get those extra bonus bets, uh, plus 1,000 to win the Super Bowl. You're welcome. All right, 
Now we can take a minute and we should talk about the tight ends because this is a really talented tight end room. We've seen that they've kind of also been bitten by the injury bug a little bit so far in camp. Uh, Josh Cuevas and Quentin Moore haven't practiced for a couple days in a row now. Uh, Ryan Otten still dealing with an injury, but Devin Culp and Jack Westover are two very talented players. There's a little bit of a, of, of a joke that Spencer McLaughlin, the host of Lockdown Pac-12 and, and Lockdown Ducks, and I have going on where in one of the, the, the previous episodes that I was on, he combined the two and he called him Jack Culp. And I said, Jack Culp would be Brock Bowers 2.0. That might be the best tight end that I've ever seen in my lifetime. Because Jack Westover is a really solid athlete has great hands and just does all the little things well. And then Devin Culp is an excellent athlete who the hands are, are hit and miss at times, but he also is just a really great blocker when, when you need him to be combine those two guys, you've, you've got a great tight end there. I was going to say who, whose hands are, who are we getting here? I think that's, <laughs> but, I, but, hands. I, but, but, I do, but I do want to say to Devin Culp's credit, his hands have gotten a lot better than camp. Absolutely. Like, like, like there was a catch that he made going toward the far sideline. It's probably, I think, what, a 25 to 30 yarder that he just plucked out of the air with both hands. But it, it almost it was like a magnet just went to his hands. And it, it, it was so it's, – it's not – because we've seen him able to do that. It just hasn't been consistent. He'll have a game where he's like, hey, you're three for three on catches, and then two crews will drop right when it matters most. It's like, okay. You're almost there. You're right on the cusp. Whereas Westover is a guy who they, basically they can get the ball in any situation. He showed that in the Alamo Bowl with a few different positions that he went to. He's also kind of an H back and really do a lot of things. And he also can hurdle defensive backs. So he's way more of the athlete. But I think to your point, if Cole can prove to have those consistent hands throughout the season, they are, those are now two security blankets that we talk about how many weapons the receiver room has. We were just talking about weapons for Penix in general because the way this offense works, as we've talked about over the past couple of days, is they just want to create space. They want to create mismatches. And you have two guys who, if they can catch the ball the way they have in fall camp, they're a mismatch nightmare and put them together. I think Brock Bowers is kind of hard to re- replicate just because of who he is. And we, we he, both he's know that. Kind. But same principle still applies to where those two guys would be a beast together. You're, you're 100% right. And I, I kind of want to take a minute because I really, really like what I've seen from Josh Cuevas, uh, the t- uh, tight end transfer from Cal Poly, where he seems like the kind of guy that you really want to utilize in the red zone. As, a, as I said, he hasn't practiced in a couple of days, but he's somebody where you just you watch his film and you watch what he've done, he's done at camp so far. It's, yeah, no, I can see that guy just kind of getting it inside the 20s. And a bold prediction that I, I can't remember if I, if I tossed it on, on here or on Lockdown Pack 12 but I think that by the end of the year, Josh Cuevas might end up leading all tight ends in catches and in touchdowns. I think that's, that's totally within the realm of possibilities because of just how his skill set fits this offense. And also I don't necessarily know if just with what we talked about just, just now with talking about the receivers and what we talked about yesterday with the running backs and how good they are at pass catching, you really don't, want multiple tight ends on the field a lot of the time, no matter how much of a mismatch nightmare they are, just because of the other positions that that this coaching staff has that they can utilize. Yeah, well, I think the other thing, too, to consider that is I think the the tight end position for Washington, because I talked to Nick Sheridan about it last week, where, yeah, everybody wants to talk about, you know, Brock Bowers, Kyle Pitts, all these, Travis Kelsey, all the, you know, George Cato, all these kind of flex tight ends where they're more pass catchers than they need to be blockers in, for Washington's offense. And so I think that's kind of wh- why Westover has always been the better of the two compared to him and Cole, because he's always had that ability to block, which also is a credit, credit to Cuevas. When I talked with Brian Grubb back at the Alamo Bowl, that's one thing they cited was not only can he break out and catch, but he can also make the hard, you know, kind of blocking plays both in the run game and when they're doing play action where you have to, you know, press, get off the line and then release. That's kind of a delayed release. That dynamic, I think, is kind of to your point what makes Cuevas probably the best tight end in terms of complete and how his product is going to carry on the field this fall. No, I, that's that's a really good point. And then we can also talk a little bit about Quentin Moore, who, when he's healthy, he's he's the same thing where he's a, a mismatch, but the hands haven't necessarily been very consistent. And he's he's improved a lot as a blocker, but I think we still need to see him take that next step as just kind of a pass catcher and a route runner which we just haven't seen yet. We just haven't seen him healthy very often. Maybe this is the year for that, but 
you know, that's, that's something where only time will tell. And then we can kind of say the same thing about Ryan Otten, former four-star recruit, obviously the, the younger brother of Kate Otten, who uh, made a name for himself last year with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I have my, I want my dynasty fantasy teams to shout out to Kate for that. But um, no, it's, it's something where I think Ryan Otten has the potential to be a better receiver than his older brother ever was, but it's the same thing. It's can he stay healthy and can he actually get on the field? Well, and I think the thing that separates Ryan and Cade, but both was Ryan was probably the better prospect coming out. I mean, people forget Cade was a linebacker coming to Washington. Yep. People forget, people forget that. But the one thing that Cade always had is he always kind of had that big country, you know, always kind of had extra muscle, you know, really could handle the physicality of playing, not the playing sport, but especially playing the sport at the Pacto level. Ryan doesn't necessarily have that. He needs to still kind of get bigger, add a little more muscle to his frame. And I think that will allow him to stay healthy or get healthy, stay healthy, and then allow him to, sh- to showcase his pass catching abilities. Because to your point, he could run the routes. I, when I would watch him in both seven on seven and, and back in high school, he could do it. He could. He was a really good pass catcher. I think it was just kind of like you need to be a little more fluid with it, need to be a little more natural with it. And I think it's certainly not hurting him the way they've developed him because he's been hurt. So there's no need to rush him. And especially to the whole point of what we're talking about this offense, we're talking about two or three, maybe tight ends. We're talking double that for the receivers or even potentially triple that for the receivers. So I think, you know, the tight end position isn't one where, Hey, we got to have every single guy there. Obviously you want him healthy, but I think Cade's a guy where if he can get healthy this year, maybe get a couple games in under his belt, just to be able to learn the game a little bit more, see the game live. That'll right. carry into next season because because if he goes another season without really getting a chance to play and he's still kind of hurt, then you kind of wonder what's next. What, how can he get healthy? Can he even stay healthy or get healthy? But I think I think he can, and I think the way they're doing it is correct. It's 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 just a matter of time, right? And some people it takes a little bit longer, and it's not the same injury. Uh, we won't really speculate, but it looks like it's kind of an upper body thing going on where last year we know it was it was something in in one of his legs. I think it might have been an ankle or a knee, something like that. Remember. Uh, the co- coaching staff definitely told us, but uh, it's just not right there at the top of my head at this very moment, which is always really fun when you're podcasting. Uh, and also, just you know, speaking of podcasting, make sure you tune in tomorrow. We're going to be finishing off our week talking about the offensive line. There's there's so much to like about the offensive line. Uh, just two exciting tackles that should be considered for All-American status by the end of the season. But for now, we're going to wrap up here talking about the tight ends. And do you think that what do, you, what do you think the ceiling for this tight end group is in terms of we're looking back on the 2023 season, however it might finish out, and let's say Jack Westover is the team's leading receiver in terms of all three stats, catches, yards, touchdowns. What do you think that looks like? I'd say, I want to say max 50, but I think that's too much. I'd probably say between 40 and 50 catches for, for, the, for Jack or whoever happens to be the number one tight end. Sure. You're probably thinking what? five six hundred yards because again the more we think about it the more i think about that it's like okay but again you're not say a thousand for rome a thousand for J- or nine for rome nine for jalen seven for polk you know uh, you start spreading it out and Penix is he's not going to get to five thousand yards though we love the guy but, he, but there, there is a probably, kind of ceiling. probably tough yeah there, there, there is a ceiling to this so i would probably say between four and five hundred yards and probably the interesting thing is going to be, can they be a factor in the red zone? Can they solve that red zone problem? Because if they can, that touchdown number could actually be double digits. If, you know, if well, all things go, if all things sure. go, well, I'd probably put, I'd probably put the over under at six and I would take the under, but at, at their core, if, if everything clicks, maybe they don't have as many rushing touchdowns because they turn them into tight end receiving touchdowns. Switching gears here. Now it's time to talk a little bit about Giles Jackson. As, as we, you can see, on the, for everybody watching on YouTube, make sure you like, comment, subscribe. But we need to talk a little bit about Giles Jackson. Uh, Ryan Grubb told us today on Wednesday that he might miss the entirety of the 2023 season. He didn't speculate. He just said he's got a thumb injury. Uh, they're checking it out right now. But one of the things that he did throw out as a possibility is redshirting, which means that he would be able to play in four games, plus any bowl game the team uh, might find their way into. But that's not great. So that kind of leads into the other things that we want to talk about recruiting and looking ahead where Giles is a senior. He has an extra COVID year of eligibility already. Thanks to being a true freshman in 2020, but this would give him two extra years of eligibility. 
we're probably not going to speculate on that situation so much because there's so much else that we have to talk about. We can talk about Jason Robinson. We can talk about Ju- Justice Williams, the two recruits from uh, that are currently part of the class of 2024. And then, obviously, the three guys that are true freshmen right now, Tayshawn Lyons, Rasheed Williams, and Keith Reynolds. And then, of course, Denzel Boston and Jeremy Bernard as well because those guys both have at least one more year before they can enter the NFL draft. So the future looks pretty bright, even outside of this, this Giles Jackson injury. And do you think that this might, not that it's obviously a good thing that somebody's hurt, but do you think that this is a good thing for the coaching staff to say, ooh, now in, instead of doing that, and yeah, we can play Tayshawn in, in spurts here, Rashid in spurts here, but now we can just give more reps to Denzel and Jeremy and just see what we really have in them before having them be a full go in 2024. Yeah, I mean, it certainly doesn't help, or it certainly doesn't hurt, right? You know, you're getting a chance to see potentially other guys. That's kind of what we, they used in camp to see who can actually handle it. I don't think you're going to truly see the freshmen in those situations much, but I do think, to your point, that it means more for Denzel and Jeremy to get those reps. And I think also, to our our point here, the tight ends could also take some of those reps away as well. Just sure. for, not, the, not the reps, but the targets. Um the thing that I kind of wonder, though, and again, this isn't exactly about today's topic, but there is another part of the game to where Giles has been taking reps that I think another receiver could actually make more of an impact, and that's Jalen McMillan in the punt return game. Oh, so so I think that is uh, watch for that story tomorrow. Actually, well, today since it's going to come out tomorrow uh, about that because I think that's honestly where this injury is going to matter more because I think no matter what Denzel and Jeremy were going to get some reps this year. I mean, Giles was 30 for 32 last year. So he was consistent. He was one of the more consistent guys in the country when it came to catching balls being thrown to him, but he didn't get a ton of targets, right? He, right. 30 compared to 70, 70, you know, 50, you know, he's kind of fourth or fifth down in that pecking order. So it's not the worst thing. So he's kind of, he's kind of a unique guy already in the offense, both in size, kind of what he can do, but he did show he could play outside last year. So I think they're, they're willing to kind of give him another year if they need to. But that's also, again, why you stack the room with so many guys, with Jeremy, with Denzel. Because, again, if you don't bring in Jeremy, now you're looking at just Denzel and potentially one other freshman. That, that, that's not as an advantageous of a scenario as a former four-star who's already played in college for a year, knows what he's got to do. And Denzel got on the field because he could run block last year. He, he sure. got more run blocking experience against the Oregon Ducks in that game on the first series than any other people want to give him credit for. That allows you then to become a pass catcher, but you have to show you could run block first. I think that this is also very quickly going to become a top transfer destination for wide receivers. Yep. And it already is. And Jeremy, obviously, is a unique situation. People, some people forget that when he entered the transfer portal, he entered with a do not contact designation because he already knew where he was going. And there's no tampering involved there because he had already spent time at Washington, both you know on the other sidelines and as a student for about a day and a half. But it's something where we look down the line and – of course, we have no idea who's going to be in the portal come December and January. But there's go- there's always going to be receiver talent in the portal, whether it be a group of five guy who wants to get one year of experience before entering the NFL draft. There were rumors that when Kalen DeBoer first came in that Jalen Cropper might enter the, um, the portal to come to Washington. But obviously that didn't happen. But he was one of the most talented guys in the group of five. And there could be just, oh, this, this guy who was a really high four-star – that went to, I don't know, Georgia, but you know, there's five guys in front of him who are going to get touches and he wants to play sooner. Maybe he comes to Washington. Those are the kinds of things that Kalen DeBoer's offense is going to continue to generate, especially if this team can find a way to be a top 10 team this year. Well, not only that, but then when you add to the fact that they're going to play in the big 10, that's even more appealing to say, Hey, I want to go against Ohio state versus going against no disrespect, Oregon state or Cal or Stanford. You know, it's like, there's a different level to where guys can now look at Washington when they go to the big 10 and say, wow, that's all That was already a good school, but now it's a great offense and a great program and a great conference. That, that That's what, that's, that's what college football players, elite college football players want is they want to go against the best week in and week out and be on the stage that they're going to be, going to in the NFL eventually. Yes. Washington's right in track with that. And I think to your point, yeah, we don't know who it's going to be, but you probably know if you have the top five transfers, you know, top, top, top five receiver transfers, Washington's going to get one of the five. You just know at least one of them is going to come to Washington. Definitely. And then just kind of before we wrap up here, I want to take a second just to talk about recruiting because I know we, we hit on it a little bit on our recruiting heavy show, but 
we can just take a minute to talk about Jason Robinson and Justice Williams because these are two very different types of receivers, but I think they both fit Washington's program so well because mm-hmm. Justice is in that mold of, of Rome, Denzel, Boston, this big, fast receiver that you can just put outside the numbers and just let him go. And then Jason Robinson has proven to be a route running savant at a very high level. Long Beach Poly is not an easy they, – they don't play in an easy conference down in Southern California. And now he's he's transferred a couple times since then. But it, he's still a really, really talented player who you just watch his film and you say, oh, I, I didn't know high schoolers could run routes like that. Just the way he puts his foot in the ground and is able to stop so fast, it's really, really impressive. And now I don't think either of those guys are going to come in and play as true freshmen in 2024, but it's just something where you look at the talent evaluation, and this is something that can be said for basically every coach on the staff, is you just watch the film and go, oh, oh, this is their top guy? Yeah, I see why. Yeah, and what's funny is it doesn't always necessarily rank in star rankings, which, again, to, to the staff's credit, it's like, Yes, again, you're going to get a lot of five stars and four stars that end up going to the NFL and et cetera, et cetera. But it's proven over time, hey, if you know what kind of guy you want, and we touched on it a couple of days ago, it's the type of guy, to your point. We need a big, tall, physical guy who already knows what he's doing. And not necessarily knows what he's doing, but you know, has a grasp, can show what he can do. And then you add a, uh, Jason Robinson, who can run the routes. Maybe he doesn't have the size you know, from a height perspective, but he has the mental approach to where he can make up for that. Almost, again, I don't – don't want to go down this road too much, but a John Ross type where he can show sure. the speed, knows how to run. He, I think knows how to run more routes than Ross did when he came out of high school. I think that's pretty fair to say at this point. But Ross had the top end speed. Robinson doesn't have that yet. If he can get there, then it's over. Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. And I, I just I, I want to say one thing. You talked about looking for a particular kind of guys. Would you say that they are our kind of guys? I'm sorry. I just I, I, I had to get out there. Just, just, just once. I, I see, I see the look you're giving me. Everyone, wa- watch on YouTube just to see that Lars is just staring daggers right into my soul for that. I'm Chris, sorry, Chris. Chris would be proud. Chris would be proud. <laughs> that's be proud. that's all I've ever wanted to hear in my life. So thank right, you for that. Right. Oh, I'll, 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 I'll take credit for him saying that because I'm sure. He, hey, he heard somewhere out there. He just, he, he just looked up and was like, yeah, yeah. No, I, I heard that. You know what? That's actually true. That dude hears everything. <laughs> But real quick, uh, just 60 seconds here, rapid fire. I want to talk about the receivers. We talked a little bit about Tayshawn Lyons. Rashid Williams has definitely impressed in moments. He looks like the kind of route runner that we saw on his high school film. But Keith Reynolds is just a guy where you look at him and you say, oh, wow. Oh, this is the talent evaluation just at work. Unranked guy coming out of high school. But he's he's bigger just in, in terms of stockier than you might have imagined when you look at his film and he's really quick in the short area has taken a plane on the slot really well. They seem to like him when returning punts as well. And he's just the kind of guy where it's, he might get on the field for a game or two this year, maybe in, I don't know, you know, the Tulsa game or some other conference blowout. If, if one of those might happen, but for the most part, you just, you just look at a guy and you, that, that guy and you say, yeah, no, I, I can see this guy down the line making a major impact for this team. Yeah, it's going to be hard to keep him off the field. It's crazy. It might be easier this year, but it, they're going to find a way to get him at least four games this year. I, I know that for a fact. I I couldn't agree more. Now, Lars, appreciate you doing this with me today. Everybody out there, we truly appreciate you listening, all you everydayers out there. Make sure you like, comment, subscribe on YouTube, wherever else you get your podcasts. Tune in tomorrow because we are going to be talking about the offensive line and just – Make sure to follow us on Twitter. Follow Lockdown Huskies on Twitter. We'll see you tomorrow.